Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the seventh press availability hosted by the Alaska Majority House Coalition. Very pleased to be in front of you this morning. Um, clearly, as we approach the halfway mark of the 90-day session, uh, the conversation about uh, this year's budget as well as uh, the fiscal future of the state, uh, those conversations are beginning uh, to come to fruition. Uh, uh, this week up in House Finance, we have uh, <clears throat> the operating budgets uh, coming together. We have public testimony slated for Thursday, Friday, <coughs> Saturday, uh, after which uh, once the uh, committee has finished its work on the operating budget, uh, they will turn their attention back to House Bill 115, which is the majority coalition's uh, plan for long-term fiscal uh, solution for the state. Um, certainly a lot of other things going on, and I'm very pleased uh, this morning to be joined by Majority Leader Tuck and the two resource, uh, House Resource Committee uh, uh, chairs to talk about other elements of our fiscal plan and any other uh, items that might be in the Resources Committee as well as at large uh, with the Majority Leader. So with that, uh, Majority Leader Tuck. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, things are moving at a quick pace. We're taking charge, taking action. We have budget subcommittees, closeouts, finals uh, are today. And uh, uh, it, just a reminder, this coalition came together to, um, to save jobs and protect our economy. And so we're going to be looking at further targeted reductions in our current spending. We're going to be um, looking at reforms to the subsidies given to the oil and gas industry. And we're going to be looking at new revenue and finding out what the most appropriate structure is um, as part of our four pillar plan. So uh, things are happening very quick. Um, we have a lot of items on the table. It's really important for the public to comment. We want to hear from you guys. Uh, this is uh, important decisions need to happen this year. Representative Tarr. Thank you, Speech Speaker Edgman. And good morning. I'm Representative Garen Tarr from Anchorage area. And I'm um, going to give a, just a bit of an update, and we'll be followed by um, comments from Co-Chair Josephson mm -hmm. on our work on House Bill 111. That's our been our oil and gas um, subsidy reform bill and um, we've been working really hard we want to thank all of the committee members who have um, been working really hard as well and appreciate their attendance for our evening meetings as well um, we know from past experience that it, it, that's what it takes when we um, take on one of these large pieces of legislation we in um, the last week have been working with our new consultant mr. rich Ruggiero. He has experience working in Alaska, as well as decades of experience working with other government jurisdictions around the world. He's been giving us some new options to consider. Um, we're really um, excited about that. We are listening to the industry, who has um, said that some of these incentives are necessary to be competitive, but we're also listening to the public. Um, in my area, 93% of my respondents in a survey said that our, our, our tax credits needed to be reformed. And more recently, the, AK, the Senate majority had a, a poll with more than 7,000 Alaskans participating, and more than 65% in their poll said, you know, reconsider the oil and, and gas tax credits. So we're listening to the industry, but we're also listening to the public and working with our consultant, um, have these new ideas to consider. And we think these could both address the problem of um, having a liability that we can't afford but also keeping Alaska competitive and making sure that new projects come online to bring um, new oil into TAP. So that's what we're focused on. Wednesday night is the public testimony. Um, that's this coming Wednesday at 6 p.m. Um, we hope Alaskans will you know, come to their local LIO or send in written comments. We'll make sure that all your comments get entered into the record. Um, and then I'd like to turn it over to Co-Chair Josephson for additional comments on the work. Thank you, Representative Tarr. I'm Andy Josephson. I represent uh, the UMED area of Anchorage. And uh, just to sort of uh, echo some of the things my co-chair said, uh, you know, one of the, the four pillars or key features of the House Majority Caucus plan is to revisit the subject of oil and gas tax credits and to some degree our tax schedules altogether. Um, broadly speaking, we're looking at much of what was considered uh, previously by the governor, both in his special se session legislation and in House Bill 247. We have a, a wonderful, I think, expert that we've hired through legislative budget and audit, and uh, he's giving us new ideas about ways to uh, peg a tax structure uh, that is not linked to price but is linked to profit, and uh, that allows for more durability in the system and more sustainability and predictability of the system. 
And we're also looking at new creative ways that would not require a cash outlay in the front end to help independence, and we think that's important. Um, and meanwhile, we're also going to have more discussion about transparency. I have House Bill 99. We think that the public should be entitled to know uh, in the aggregate what is a company receiving, what benefits are they receiving, and where are they receiving it. And so those are uh, some other features we're going to be looking at. So we'd like to open things up for questions. And as always, uh, please identify yourself. <clears throat> Austin Baird from KTU. Uh, for whoever wants it, it, it seems like the appetite is not there on the Senate side to do oil tax, uh, oil gas tax credit reform in the way that uh, the resource co-chairs would like to see. So policy aside and substance aside, how do you accomplish what you want to see done politically? Well, I'll just take a first stab at that. Actually, Mr. Ruggiero is going to go present to the Senate Resources Committee on Wednesday. And I think it would be premature in the process to say that, you know, we can't come to a resolution that everyone agrees with. I think that they'll hear from him some of these ideas that have intrigued us. And we'll look forward to having a conversation with them following that to see if, if some of these ideas are also um, in their mind, worth consideration. So I, I think it's premature to, to say that that won't happen, and, and I think um, we all have a lot to learn from Rich. Yeah, and I, I'll just add this. I mean, I, I hope that, <clears throat> excuse me, that the Senate reconsiders that position. I mean, we have uh, a credit outlay that we can't afford, uh, almost by definition, and, and the governor is going to veto it, and, and we've seen that there wasn't the will, for whatever reason, to override that veto in July. So we've got that. We have a $3 billion deficit. Uh, and the idea that we're going to continue this sort of generosity, I mean, we'd love to do it when we had $9 billion a year come into the coffers like we did in 2010, but we don't have that. And so it, it's sort of surprising to me that that, that logic wouldn't uh, just come through. <clears throat> Good morning. <clears throat> Nat Hurst with Alaska Dispatch News. Um, we heard, I think, I think pretty clearly from the Senate majority yesterday that um, they they want to sort of separate the discussion about uh, sort of a legislation to restructure the permanent fund from other elements of a fiscal plan, be that an income tax or uh, changes to oil and gas taxes um, or anything else. Um, how do you guys respond to that? I'll just say that uh you know, Alaskans are tired of politicians always going the easy route, and that is going after the permanent fund dividend. And uh, sure, that fixes a lot of problems, but uh, Alaskans don't want to see a uh, fix to the permanent fund without a fix to the oil taxes. And when we talk about an appetite, Alaskans do have an appetite to see changes happen um, with uh, these uh, unsustainable cash subsidies. Um, setting the floor so we're no longer going upside down in our production taxes and making sure that uh, working Alaskans aren't burdening, burdened with the uh, responsibility of, uh, of supporting the oil industry. So um, I think it's an easy, easy statement to make at the, for the Senate to just uh, uh, do a permanent fund dividend only plan. Um, but uh, we're doing the hard work over here in the House. We have a lot of options on the table. Um, we're moving very quickly with our budget subcommittee closeouts. We're going to be, uh, finance is doing a great job of uh, putting a package together as long as, as well as our resources people in, in, in coming up with solutions so that uh, we're not burdening one group of people over another group. So, so that, I mean, it, it sounds like that's a pretty significant difference in the way that each chamber is thinking about this problem. How, how are you going to resolve that? Well, the public, we have the public on our side. And, uh, you know, the governor came up with this courageous plan last year, a comprehensive plan. Um, we're all in this together. And so um, if we do our jobs right, everybody's going to share in the burden, and Alaskans will, will be proud of the work that we did. Um, I think that the Senate's going to have a hard time convincing Alaskans that that's the, their plan is the plan because their plan is a lazy plan. We've always said that we wanted to have a comprehensive solution. And the business community, if you look at the priorities from the business community, the different chambers of commerce, comprehensive fiscal plan is at the top of their list. It needs, it needs to be a comprehensive plan. Becky Bohr at the Associated Press. For the co-chairs, um, on um, 
the issue of oil taxes. Representative Guerra had um, a farther reaching oil tax bill. Do you anticipate marrying any provisions from that bill to your bill, or is the, is the intent with your bill to sort of stick to the provisions that you've already outlined? We are considering some <coughs> items um, that we've been discussing with the consultant that aren't in the bill right now. And I think it, it, we are going to have a hearing on Representative Guerra's bill. Our attitude has been let's get all good ideas on the table. Um, we do hope that we can come up with something with some durability that works well at all prices because we feel like a lesson learned here is is that <laughs> the prices are very volatile. We have no control, and, and we should have something um, that prepares for that. One of the suggestions by Rich is a self-correcting system, and he showed us some examples yesterday of how you can do that um, so we don't have to respond to market changes, but we would be in better positioned um, because the, the system itself would be self-correcting. So we're going to consider that. Um, and you know, I think Representative Guerra has some, some different ideas about progressivity. Even Rich has suggested that, and Mr. Brenna suggested that it's it's always come up that one way the state can support the industry in downtimes is that we get a little more during the uptimes and so we're gonna we're gonna look at that as well and that's one of the features of rep Gara's bill morning Liz rains from KTVA representative Clayman has a, a bill that was introduced that um, <clears throat> excuse me has to do with an education head tax um, uh, your caucus has uh, come together around the idea of a, some sort of a, a broad-based tax uh, might that be a viable alternative uh, possibly um, that bill got referred to uh, the House Education Committee and the Finance Committee afterwards and so we're looking forward to a, a very robust uh, conversation in the Education Committee on a, a topic that hasn't been around for a long time. And I can tell you from at least my perspective as a, a, someone who represents a rural district in Southwest Alaska, that among the older constituents in particular, I heard a lot about the education and the head tax. And people would tell me, look, we paid this way back when, and uh, we don't mind paying it again. Um, and uh, we, you know, we value public education and we think it's important. And, and you know, again, we'd pay for it or help pay for it. Do you think that would be an easier sell with the other body, perhaps, than an income tax? That's a great question. Um, you know, <clears throat> I think it's pretty clear that our caucus uh, uh, has placed a high priority on keeping uh, uh, funding uh, intact for uh, K through 12 for public education. Uh, we're very uh, strong supporters of uh, the school system in Alaska. And uh, in terms of a broad-based tax, um, clearly it's one of the four pillars that our uh, coalition has come forward on, one you know, being new revenues of some sort. And uh, uh, an education tax, uh, you know, part of uh, what House Bill 150, 115 and House Finance is doing right now is uh, sort of engendering public uh, response, bringing commentary forward, bringing, uh, providing us valuable input on what the public supports and what perhaps they don't support. So an education uh, uh, tax uh, uh, bill like Representative Clayman's uh, probably is going to do the same thing. And so we will see as time goes forward. And I think what's important is that we are putting all options on the table. We have even different oil tax bills that are being introduced resources. And uh, so all the ideas are going to be uh, moving, all the ideas. And we're, and we're taking ideas not just from majority members, any minority members that have ideas also. We'll move their bills, we'll consider their bills, we'll hear their bills. And, uh, but uh, we're all in this together. Um, we are leading by example by having Alaska independents, Alaska Democrats, and Alaska Republicans coming and, and forming this coalition. And uh, we're going to be all inclusive. So we, we do plan on working with the Senate. Um, we 